I have a couple of children, and that's where I want to start this story. I have a newly minted teenager, and I have a preteen. And sometimes I'll get it in my head to have a conversation with them about what life was like before the internet was invented. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I'll try to explain to them, listen, how quickly everything's changed and how much a part of our lives it's become and how quickly it's been you know, manifested, all this stuff, and they will give me this look that I imagine must be a dead ringer for the look that I gave my parents in the 1970s when they tried to explain to me about what life was like before television was invented. And I remember not really being able to get my mind around that concept. I mean, to a kid growing up in the 1970s, television was a kind of a media god, I guess you could say. You know, there really, really wasn't that much competition. Nowadays, those of you who have kids know this, nowadays, it's like one deity in a vast, diverse media pantheon, right? My 10-year-old daughter, for example, watches YouTube easily as much as she watches television. And when she watches it, she often watches things that would never be on television. I mean, I'll give you an example. One of the things she really likes right now involves two girls that are also about her age. I think their names are Casey and JC. And I think they do something called the Tin Can Challenge. But what it really is is they, they get together a bunch of strange food, they mix it together, and then they eat it, and then you get to see their reactions on camera. And my daughter thinks this is hysterical, by the way, right? <laughs> Nothing that a network news program would ever put on TV, but, but my daughter loves it. And, you know, being 10 years old, I imagine that this Casey and JC team have a parent who films this for them and who puts it on YouTube for them. But within a month of doing that, and this is where it gets crazy, they will get, generally, over a million views. A million views. And we are blasé about this. I mean, I'll tell people this and they'll think to themselves, oh yeah, it's not even that surprising. Great, good girls, way to go, a million views. When I was a kid, when many of you were kids, there was nothing we could have done to get a million views anywhere, <laughs> right? I mean, there were these shows that you could get your five minutes of fame if you had some weird talent. You could go on That's Incredible, or The Gong Show, or Real People, or something like that. But basically, in the 20th century, the media that was so dominating in all of our lives was a really tightly controlled thing. And very few people actually had anything to do with it. Now, it wasn't a conspiracy or anything, it just wasn't easy to do media, right? I mean, try getting a radio signal or a television broadcast out to the public. You need things, don't you? You need equipment and infrastructure, and you need money, don't you? Right? It's something that by its very nature, only a few people can do. And I remember getting this lesson myself in the 1970s when I was about 10, and I decided I wanted to start my own newspaper. Sounded like a great idea, right? Very Little Rascals, our gang style. I knew I was serious about it because I went into my dad's wardrobe closet, took out like his best shirt, I'm sure he was thrilled, right? Got a tie, have no idea what I tied a tie like. I still can't tie one, and at 10 it must have been worse. Slicked my hair back, went down into the you know, room in our house that we had designated as the media offices, with certainly my whole neighborhood of kids in there working on my little fantasy. And we were able to have this little newspaper game until my dad decided a couple days later to break the ugly truth to a kid in the 1970s that at 10 years old, you can't have your own newspaper, right? You gotta have a few things. You gotta have printing presses. You gotta have a distribution network. All of this sounded relatively logical, I guess, to a disheartened, heartbroken 10-year-old media mogul, right? <laughs> but you know, fast forward 40 years, and the Casey and JC tin can challenge that my daughter watches on YouTube looks like it could be on television in terms of its quality level. And more than a million people have seen it. I mean, just so you know, that's more audience members than almost any newspaper in America has. Right? Think about that for a minute. I mean, the amount of change that has happened in media and the way it has been opened up to the general public is unlike anything that's ever been seen. If you went and looked at 20th century media, right, it was, by its very nature, hard for people to get into, right? There was a need to have a mass audience. There was no place for, you know, anything that didn't have a mass appeal. You go back, say, 1990, and you watch something like The Golden Girls on television, which was a popular TV show, but not a super popular TV show, but they had 20 to 30 million viewers for every new broadcast. That at the time was about 10% of the entire American population. 
They don't get numbers like that for sitcoms anymore. Those are crazy numbers, right? Nowadays, you get you know, five million people watching a program, and you can live off of that, right? Back then, five million people got your TV program canceled. You have opportunities that didn't exist back then, right? In the, in the 21st century, you can go out and reach billions of people, right? Once upon a time, when I was in radio, you would go out and you had a physical transmitter distance that you could go. And as soon as you drove out of that distance, you couldn't hear me anymore. The internet, though, is billions of people, right? It's this enormous pie. And if you only can reach a tiny little fraction of that pie, it's still a ton of human beings. I mean, there are billions of people in my potential audience online at podcasting, right? What is 1% of a billion, okay? It's 10 million. You could be an internet sensation by reaching a fraction of the audience out there, the potential audience, right? So you look at something like broadcasting, which means appealing to a broad section of the population, okay? There's a reason in the 1970s you had to do that. The programming was so expensive. Right? You could never recoup your money from the golden girls if you didn't have an entirely huge audience. But nowadays, the cost of doing media has shrunk to such a degree that you, know, you can practically do it out of your home. I was joking earlier that if you take a big star like an Eddie Murphy, right, somebody who required, like they all did, somebody to discover them, give you a chance. Right? It doesn't matter how much talent you have. If one of these people who are sort of media gatekeepers doesn't allow you the opportunity, you know, you upset somebody, you step on someone's toes, somebody doesn't like the way you look, you don't have a career. A guy like Eddie Murphy, were he coming up today, if he had the technology that we had in the 1970s, he could do a podcast just showing his stand-up comedy, right? And without ever having to be on Saturday Night Live to become famous, he could, you know, out of his house at almost no cost and with nobody's permission, become a household name, go viral, have millions of people following him. This is what the next Eddie Murphy could do. This is what you could do, right? It's a meritocracy now when it comes to media, okay? It's, it wasn't that way before. Media has always been controlled. They've always been gatekeepers because there's a lot of power in controlling the access to an audience, right? I always like to think that even in ancient Greek times, there was some guy who owned the amphitheater who went to all those ancient Greek playwrights that we still celebrate and learn about in theater class today and said, listen, take out line four, or you're not getting on the stage, right? Those people have always existed and they've always controlled what went on their stages. The, the theater people control what went on their stages, the radio people control what went over their airwaves, the editors controlled you know, what went in the magazines and the newspapers that they printed. I mean, I'll give you an example. What if, what if you could go and simply put a program online and have a ton of people watch it and have it never go away, right? There's a certain amount of immortality to this new media. I mean, we may call it new, but it's possible that this stuff is gonna last forever, okay? So if you think about immortality in a sense, and the ability to go and create something and pour your soul into something and some of, some of what makes you you, and then think about somebody 500 years from now listening to that or seeing that if it's video and getting this little piece of you I mean, as a history guy, I always try to imagine if the kind of stuff that we can do today had existed centuries ago, how well we would know the past. I mean, what if Alexander the Great 2,300 years ago had a podcast, right? How well would we know this guy? And so when you think about doing a podcast today or a blog or a vlog or an indie music piece or an indie video or a zine or even amateur news or journalism, you think about the fact that your great, 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 great grandchildren are going to get to know who we are through all this. Right? This is how they're going to understand our times and our culture. I would love to have that from an earlier time period. I mean, let me ask you a question. What's going to happen? What's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen, when five years from now, ten years from now, some individual or small group of individuals gets more viewers than a network nightly TV newscast? And I know everybody's thinking, oh, that'll never happen. I'm here to tell you, we're not that far away from that right now. And if you don't think that's going to change everything, just imagine something called Joe's Nightly Newscast competing with the NBC TV News for ratings. That's going to be really different. And one of the reasons why is because the host of Joe's Nightly Newscast, unlike the NBC Nightly News, could be anybody, right? I mean, we're living in an era 
where media is transitioning from a sort of an aristocratic setup to a democratic one. And what that means is you are living in the first era ever where you can decide to be a part of media whether or not anyone else says that's okay. The real transformation here is that media has been democratized. Access to an audience has been democratized. And this is extremely unusual. I mean, you go back into history. I mean, have you ever tried to write a newspaper article? Right? Have you ever done that? A lot of people out there have probably done that. I've done that. And what's amazing when you write a newspaper article is you really get to see what kind of power these media gatekeepers have. Right? First of all, when you do an article like this, you usually have to write a cover letter to the editor. And there's a format for this. I mean, there's a protocol. Dear sir, please consider my 750-word submission on this, that, or the other thing. Right? And if you screw that part of it up, they're going to say no to your article before anybody even gets a chance to look at it. If they don't like your article and the way you wrote it, they're going to reject it. If they don't like the subject you chose, they're going to reject it. If they don't like your take on the subject you chose, they're going to reject it. Most of the time, whatever piece you submit to the old media is going to be rejected before an audience ever has a chance to weigh in on the matter. Okay? That's what's different now. Now you can't be canceled. Now you can't have access to an audience shut down. The people who've controlled this access forever, they still have great power. You'd love to be discovered, wouldn't you? Love to find out, hey, a comedy scout found me, put me up on stage, saved me a lot of time and trouble. But they haven't shut you down if they don't do that now. And that's what's different than before. I mean, once upon a time, these people were so powerful that they could promote an artist or they could censor them. They could blackball them or they could say something like a little trip to the casting couch without your clothes on might increase your publication opportunities, right? If a segment of the audience or a sponsor didn't like what you do, or if not enough of them liked what you do, they could restrict your access to this audience. We used to call that getting canceled, right? They can't cancel you anymore. This is where everything has truly been transformed. You have, and everyone else around us, has a chance to make their mark in media in a way that simply has never before been possible. We are living through a time that is a creativity revolution. There's a, a line I love from Napoleon, the French emperor who famously said that quantity has a quality all its own, okay? I used to have discussions with all sorts of executives in media in the 1990s. Now, we would be talking about what we called back then amateur content. We would talk about the future of amateur content. And they would say to me, who's gonna wanna see any of this stuff? Right? Who's going who's to care? They're not gonna, anybody who could make anything of value would be getting paid for it. And what I would say to those people was that the sheer amount of content that people were going to create someday would make up for the difference. It might not be as good as often as the professional stuff, but you'd be able to compensate for the lack of professionalism with numbers. If only 1% of the amateur content that is out there is great, that's still going to be a ton of stuff when there are millions of content creators out there doing work. So the scale in the number of creators is transformative. The scale in the audience is transformative. I mentioned the Golden Girls a minute ago. You don't need to get 20 or 30 million people anymore. Now, if you're a network television station, and I say, why don't you do a show on science fiction comic books of the 1950s, they're going to look at you like you're crazy, right? They'll get a half million people watching that show, and it'll be a disaster. On the other hand, if you do a podcast on science fiction comic books from the 1950s, I bet you'd love to have a half million people tuning into your podcast, wouldn't you? And I bet those people tuning into your podcast would love to have you know, some production that is narrowly targeted toward their specific interest. You know, I always tell people online, there are multiple Harry Potter podcasts online right now. And if you are a devoted Harry Potter fan looking for Harry Potter content, I mean, what sort of alternative is the old media providing for you, right? There's a whole new window of opportunity here. This road that the media used to keep closed, there was no access to this road, is now opened up. And what we're beginning to see is, is an explosion in the quantity of human creativity. I mean, if you look at how many people were producing entertainment and art a hundred years ago compared to the number of people that are producing entertainment and art today, think about how much extra stuff they're going to have a hundred years from now, right? So the reason that this is a road less traveled is because the media has always been a private road. And we live in an era now where they have access 
to the tools of creation and the audience that's the reason you create something in the first place, right? And I'm pretty darn convinced that 100 years from now, our descendants are going to look back on this period and they're going to label this for what it is, right? The era where media was truly democratized. And because it was, this will be the era where human creativity in terms of its output exploded. Thank you.